Hello and welcome. So as you might have guessed from the title, this video is a bit of a primer for my pathfinding series. So what I'm going to be doing in this video is I'm going to give you a bit of a background with pathfinding stuff, give you a bit of a sense of sort of the, the key bits and pieces there of how it works. And I'm going to give you a bit of an indication of what each section of the pathfinding tour is actually going to cover. So if there's a particular area that you just want to dive straight on into, you'll be able to do that because you know exactly where to head for that. Uh, now, depending upon when you're watching this video, not all of the parts for the tour may be out. Uh, the parts of the tour will be rolling out over a two week period and I'll have a link below. So as soon as any of the parts are out, you'll be able to access those via the link below and they'll be available there on the channel. So let's get started. So the beginning, what we're looking at is with pathfinding, we've actually got this bit of a layer cake. At the very lowest level, we have path data, which is the information we need to be able to build path data. So that's going to be our first stops in the tour is looking at how do we go about building up path data. Then after path data, we actually have our pathfinding algorithms. So we'll look at how we can implement an A-star pathfinding algorithm. We're going to be focusing on some key areas there in terms of, okay, how do we manage to make this run well, run efficiently for quite large environments? That's going to be a little bit of our focus there with that. And then sitting on top of pathfinding, we have our navigation system. So it's a navigation system's job to request a path, but also to then take that path and be able to guide the character along it. So we'll have a look at how we can set up a very basic navigation system. We'll be looking at some stuff there in terms of, okay, how can we enable them to skip ahead and to take shortcuts? That's going to be part of it. And while it won't be something that we look at in this video, it will be stuff we look at later on. Sitting on top of our navigation system is our AI behaviors. So this is the sort of full stack that we see for a artificial intelligence in a game. AI behaviors talk to the navigation system to move them to a particular location. Navigation system talks to pathfinding to find out a path that will get you there. And then the pathfinding system assembles that path using information from the path data. So we're gonna be building all of this up apart from the AI behaviors, which we'll look at separately. So to kick off with, a bit of background in terms of path data. We've got a bunch of different types. So one of the earliest types is something called a spatial graph. So we generally can differentiate different types of path data based upon what each one uses as its node. So path data is a whole collection of nodes that are linked by edges and we move from node to node through edges to get to our destination. So a spatial graph, our node is a single point. So it's like walking along uh, tight ropes between a bunch of poles. That's what we have for a spatial graph. That's an older style of one. You just you do still see it used at times. There are still some really valid uses for it if you've got very specific movement that you're needing a character to do. These days, the common one that you're generally seeing that one that's used in a lot of games is something called navigation meshes. So these, rather than our node being a point, our, need, our node is a polygon. So it might be a triangle, might be a hexagon, might be a square, could be a whole range of different ones. For the setup we're building, because we're working with a terrain, we're going to be using a square grid there. So regular grid that allows us a bunch of optimizations, which is going to come in really handy, but they don't need to always be regular shapes. They don't always need to be the same size. They can be varying sizes, but that's the key thing. Navigation mesh, it defines an area that you can walk on. And so that's the more commonly used one for full 3D movements. So something that can move freely in all axes, then you might see navigation volume. So using, for example, cubes there, but it varies depending upon the particular setup. You can also use spatial graphs for that as well. 
So the first video is going to be focusing on building up that path to Ardor and being able to take a procedurally generated terrain and turn that into path data and looking at how do we store that efficiently. So we're we'll doing some serialization tricks there to allow us to store that data separately and to store that data efficiently so that we're not using up a large amount of space. Then after we've looked at building up the basic data, we're going to look at how to support multiple resolutions. Because one of the things with that is, you know, say we build stuff at one meter by one meter, that's a lot of nodes. If we can drop to two meters by two meters, we've reduced the resolution by half, but we've reduced the number of nodes by a quarter. So we'll look at how we can set up and build multiple sets of path data at different resolutions, because that will allow us to choose the size, the scaling that is most appropriate to our characters. And that will allow us to, in some cases, use coarser resolutions, which will let us have less path data, which means we can pathfind a lot faster. So we'll be looking at a few things like that. We'll also look at building up something called connectivity. So working out what areas of the path data connect to each other so that we can very, very, very quickly answer the question of, is there any potential for a path to exist from point A to point B? We'll be able to answer that question almost instantaneously, which will save us a lot of time. It'll mean our pathfinding won't be spending time searching for paths that don't actually exist. So after we've built up our path data, we're going to move on to pathfinding and we're going to be looking at the A star algorithm. So it's a very well established one. It's very commonly used and it's a really good example one to be getting familiar with. And the reason for that in part is because there's a lot of algorithms that extend or augment that. So it's something that is an ancestor for a lot of different algorithms. So getting an understanding of it is a really good starting point. A star itself is actually based upon Dijkstra's algorithm. So it's building off of previous ones. Now, broadly how A star works is it has three costs. We have a G cost, which that's how much it costs us to go from the start to whatever node in the path data we're currently evaluating, that we're currently sorting through for being able to do our pathfinding. The thing that it has, which it's added onto Dijkstra, is something called a H cost or heuristic cost. This is an estimate of how much it will cost to go from a particular node to the destination. And A star combines those two into something called an F cost which is the G plus H. It's the cumulative cost that we can calculate for any node that represents not just the cost to reach that node, but then the additional, how, long, how much we think it will actually cost to reach the end. And A star uses that and it finds the lowest F cost path. That's what it will do. And it will reliably do that for us. And typically that cost is a distance, but it doesn't have to be. We could be using time, we could be using fuel, anything really we want there, we can be using that. And whatever we pick is what the A star will minimize. If we want our AIs to always take the shortest path, we use distance. If we want them to always find the fastest path, we could use time. We could be switching that as we're actually running. And with how we set this up, so part of in that video, what we'll be looking at is setting up the A star in a way where we control how that cost is calculated for each pathfind. So we could pathfind differently at different times or for different AIs. So that'll be a key part of the setup there and allow us to really, really easily actually substitute in our own different calculations there. So it's going to be the big focus there. Then we're going to look at how we can make it faster. So we're going to go a little bit lower level with containers. So using something called sorted set. So being able to optimize the general performance of our pathfind, because it'll already be fast, but we're going to make it faster. We're going to also set up performance budgets because pathfinding doesn't exist in a vacuum. It has to exist alongside 
other sections of code. So we need to make it as efficient as possible. The faster we make it, the more time we've got available for being able to do really cool effects, being able to have more intricate levels, a lot more things that we can be spending that time on. So we're going to be looking at that. We'll also help prevent infinite loops, which is really easy to have happen with this stuff, and also be able to minimize the lag before decisions get made. Alongside that, and related to that, we'll be setting up asynchronous pathfinding. So being able to have that pathfinding run in the background and distribute that load over multiple frames is going to be a key thing we look at there. And then finally, we'll be refining and improving our interface to the pathfinding because we want to make sure that those interfaces are simple and they're really consistent so that it's very easy to take a block of code and say, okay, well, this, this doesn't need to be a synchronous pathfinder. Now I've written it for that. Let's change it to be asynchronous. So we're going to be doing that of making it so that it's a fairly consistent, fairly clean interface for it. And then the final thing we will look at in the last video is we're going to build a basic navigation system. So something that can request new paths when that target is moved, something that can move from point to point along a particular path and identify when it's reached a particular point or reached the destination. And it'll be able to look for and take shortcuts. So that will help improve the appearance of its movement as well. And we'll also, related to that, be doing some general optimization for the path. So not optimizing the path finding, but optimizing the path that we find, removing redundancies from that. So we'll be able to thin down the amount of data needed for a path. And as part of that, we're going to set up a system so we can perform a raycast through a path to check and see if we can actually reach a particular point. So those are the key topics that we're going to be looking at in the five videos that are part of this tour. As I said, in the description below, you'll find the link to all of the videos from that are currently available. If any of the videos are not yet available, there'll be a bit of an indication there of when you'll be able to see those videos. But dive on in and have a look at the videos. If you've got questions, chuck in a comment below. I've also included a link to a Google form where if you want to submit questions there for going into the next Q&A video that you can do that. So dive in and ask those questions and dive into some really cool, really fun pathfinding. Bye.